like the Kazamp website afterwards. Um, but we will just record the presentation section. So we'll employ Chatham House rules for the Q&A session. So before the main presentations, I would just like to hand the floor to the technical secretaries of the three UN agencies that are sponsoring the, the working group, just to say a few words of welcome and provide uh, a very small bit of background. So firstly, I'd like to hand the floor to John Lansley from the lead agency, which is the FAO. John, you have the floor. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is John Lansley. I'm working within the Fishing Technologies and Operations team based in, in Rome. On behalf of FAO, I'd like to thank all the members of the GESAMP Working Group 43 for their continued and determined efforts to complete this work despite the challenges of COVID-19. I only had the pleasure to meet the group in person once, which was actually during my very first week uh, in FAO back in September 2019, when we held a physical uh, working group meeting in, in Rome, and I was very impressed by the level of expertise and professionalism. Future planned physical meetings had to be cancelled uh, owing to COVID restrictions. However, the group adapted well and managed what was needed to be achieved working remotely. I would like to express particular gratitude to Chairperson uh, Kirsten Gallardi for all her hard work and for expertly coordinating this group. The term of reference of this group has a special focus on abandoned, lost, or otherwise discarded fishing gear, otherwise referred to as ALDFG, and this work is very important to FAO. Indeed, the COFI, the Committee of Fisheries Declaration of uh, 2021, reiterates the importance to reduce the impact on marine litter and ALDFG. The future work plan of FAO's Fisheries and Aquaculture Division, in the form of the Blue Transformation Roadmap, which is currently in development, addresses this by including collection and dissemination of data on the impact of fisheries on the environment, including all forms of pollution, which include marine plastic litter and ALDFG. This activity will contribute to the target of ecosystems restored to a healthy and stable state to support needs for sustainable food production and livelihoods. As such, the findings of this current report are very important for guiding FAO on, on the work addressing ALDFG. It has been a pleasure to act as technical secretary to this group and an honor to continue the great work of Joanna Till who together with our IMO colleague, Frederick Hegg, had the idea for establishing this group in the first place. Joanna played a key role in all the initiatives and efforts to address ALDFG and ghost fishing globally. Her contributions continue to be admired worldwide and she is much missed by all those that, that knew her. I look forward to reviewing the group's terms of reference following the publication of this report in order to determine how best the group can assist and guide FAO in addressing the issue of marine plastic litter originating from both the fish capture sectors and the agriculture sectors. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy this webinar. Thank you, John. Very nice words there, indeed. Uh, now I'd like to hand over to Frederick, Frederick Haag, uh, who's here at the IMO. Frederick. Thanks, Andy, and uh, thank you, John, for so eloquently putting the work of the working group uh, into context from our agency's perspectives. Uh, from IMO's side, uh, this report and the efforts by the working group they, they're very important to us since gaining a better understanding of the role that sea-based sources play in the overall issue of marine plastic litter is crucial, not least to support the IMO action plan to address marine plastic litter from ships, which was adopted here in 2018. It is also of utmost importance to the parties of the London Convention and Protocol in their work to further strengthen their efforts on this issue. So I'm sure that the report, which is in its very final publication stages and should be av available within weeks on the exam website, will be of great interest to our member states and observers alike, and will definitely help in targeting our efforts to address marine litter with the, within the regulatory regimes of MARPOL and the London Convention and Protocol, but also to strengthen our work with other partners such as FAO and UNEP and beyond. So I don't want to take much of your time, but once again, just thank Kirsten and the, the members of the working group. Uh, and I look forward to the presentation, the discussion, as well as the final publication in the near future. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Frederick. And finally, I'd pass the floor to Joanna uh, Akrofi, who is uh, from UNEP. Joanna. 
Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, let me at this point just be in agreement with um, the remarks that my colleague um, Jonathan and of course um, Frederick from um, FEO and IMO respectively have made. So what will be left for me to do at this point is to express great appreciation to the working group, um, Chair Kirsting and the members of the team for an excellent job with a um, very limited number of meetings and working through a pandemic, which was a novelty to everyone, you were able to complete your assignment in good time. And this is very much appreciated. I also would like to express gratitude to my colleagues, uh, Jonathan and um, Frederick once again. Uh, thanks for your kind support and taking up the lion's share of, of this one. And um, I'm glad to say that UNEP has been very happy to be a co-sponsor of this uh, working group, uh, which has pro produced this report on sea-based sources of marine litter, building on the broader understanding of um, such sources of marine litter, and in particular from the fishing and shipping sectors. Um, we have already been part of the broader uh, plastics um, agenda, where under working group 40, we focused on the sources, faith and effect of plastics and microplastics in the marine environment, which is currently on the fourth stage of um, a study. Um, I would also like to add that this particular uh, piece of work on the working group uh, 43 uh, has been included in an updated in the latest assessment report by UNEP on marine litter and microplastics in the marine environment. And this will be presented to the UNIA processes and will be part of UNIA 5, which will be looking at key opportunity to connect the dots, strengthening overall commitment and bringing strategic focus to the global efforts to tackle marine litter and plastic pollution next February at UNIA 5. Thank you very much. And uh, hand over to Andrew. Thank you, Joanna. Indeed, thank you to Frederick and John as well for uh, setting the scene there from the, the sponsoring agency's perspective and certainly whetted uh, the appetite, I think, for the presentation on the uh, report of the group. But before we, we hand over to, to Kirsten, we are, I'd like to uh, hand over to Professor David Bowsden, who's going to give us some background on Gazamp itself. Um, David has a career spanning over 30 years during which he has worked in various governmental and UN positions, all related to environmental management, and he's provided expert advice and professional evaluation services to marine ecosystem management and ocean governance initiatives in every global ocean and many of the world, world seas. So it's my pleasure to hand over to David now and um, he's going to uh, take us through the first presentation. So if you want to share your screen, David. I'll do that in just a second, Andrew. Thank you very much for that intro. And thank you for the kind words of welcome from our GASAMP sponsoring organizations, uh, FAO, IMO, and UNEP. The report from GASAMP Working Group 43 on sea-based sources of marine litter represents yet another milestone for the GASAMP team. And this highly detailed report provides us with an up-to-date understanding of the at-sea sources of marine litter from sectors such as shipping and, and fishing. And you'll be hearing more about that, obviously, in the details in the course of this webinar. GASAMP reports and study series capture the efforts and conclusions of the various GASAMP working groups. And it's fair to say they're held in high esteem by both the United Nations sponsoring organizations and by the scientific community at large. Yet surprisingly few people actually know about GASAM, what it stands for and what its function is. So as the chair of GASAM, I'd like to introduce you all to GASAM in order to uh, launch us into the main section of this webinar. So if everything goes to plan, I should be able to share a screen with you. Does that look okay? I'll just... How's that looking? 
That's looking good, David. Excellent. Good. OK, well, let's start off by actually realising what Gassamp means, because not everybody knows. And I know before I joined Gassamp, I didn't have a clue of what the whole uh, acronym meant. So it's the Joint Group of Experts on the Scientific Aspects of Marine Environmental Protection. Uh, and this is an interagency body of the United Nations, which was established in 1969. Its purpose is to provide authoritative, uh, independent, and it's an interdisciplinary scientific advice to the organizations and governments to support the protection and sustainable use of the marine environment. Uh, specifically, it's supported by 10 sponsoring organizations, and you should be able to see those listed at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, how does GASAMP function? Well, those 10 UN sponsoring organizations, they support the uh, GASAMP body, uh, which consists of the executive committee, which is the UN sponsoring organizations themselves, uh, agencies, the GASAMP office or secretariat, which is based in IMO, uh, and then the GASAMP membership, which varies, but is at the moment, I believe, is about 16 plus independent experts. And out of this GASAMP uh, body itself, uh, we have working groups set up, task teams, correspondence groups, uh, and I'll explain all of those to you as we go forward. Uh, and they provide advice back to the UN, specifically back to these 10 UN sponsoring agencies, but also to other UN bodies if they request it. And we have various partners, of course, the regional seas, industries, science bodies, conventions, NGOs, foundations, etc. And we bring in other independent experts and external reviewers, particularly into the uh, working groups. The membership, as of this month, um, is made up of 11 countries, of which uh, the majority, six, are actually developing countries. So the working groups are set up by GASAMP to carry out individual studies and assessments, uh, and those are requested by one or more of its sponsoring organizations, very much like this working group 43. Um, they're proposed and established, as I say, by the sponsoring organizations, focusing on addressing an issue of concern which has been identified by the organization or by the members or indeed by a member state to carry out individual studies and assessments. These groups generally are chaired by a GASAMP member and are made up of leading global experts who are not necessarily members of GASAMP itself. So this helps to broaden the GASAMP network activities and allows expertise to come into the working group um, that can be focused on and tailored to the specific requirements of that project. The working groups all have formal terms of reference and the membership is agreed with a sponsoring organization uh, that's supporting that working group. And the reports from the working groups are normally considered for publication in GASAMP reports and study series after peer review and approval by GASAMP. They may also uh, and quite commonly do go on to become uh, publications within the recognized scientific literature. Uh, I'll run briefly through the working groups that exist at the moment. There have been many since GASAMP was first established in 1969, so um, the numbers are not necessarily in order because some of them have, um, have moved on and been uh, disbanded. Uh, we have the evaluation of the hazards from harmful substances carried by ships, uh, and that's self-funded from IMO itself because it advises the uh, Marine Environmental Protection Committee. Similarly, working group 30, uh, 34, looks at uh, reviews, uh, the applications that are being made for active substances in ballast water management systems, also directly self-funded through IMO. Um, so all of the working groups have a sponsoring organization or more than one, and I won't bother reading those out because you can see them at the end there, but WG38 is looking at the atmospheric inputs of chemicals to the ocean. We have WG40 looking at sources, fate and effect of plastics and microplastics. 41, looking at ocean interventions for climate change mitigation. 42, the impacts of wastes and other matter in the marine environment from mining operations, including marine mineral mining. 43, of course, sea-based resources and marine litter, including fishing gear and other shipping related litter. Biofouling management and climate change and greenhouse gas related impacts on contaminants in the ocean. So those are the functional uh, active working groups at the moment. And the normal outputs from each working group would be technical recommendations, for example, to IMO and to its uh, Marine Environmental Protection Committee. Technical reports that go into the GASAMP reports and studies series, 
but also management and policy observations that can be paid, passed back to the sponsoring organizations of GASAMP. Identifying the science gaps and needs in the particular subject area of the working group that need to be uh, developed, researched on, studied. Other publications within recognized scientific journals. And the GASAMP reports and study series probably is, is the, the most obvious form of, of product that comes out of the working groups. And they can be found on the GASAMP website. I'll give you the link to that at the end. Um, and then you'll see their sources and fates and effects of microplastics in the marine environment, um, which actually went to a part two because there was so much work done on that. Pollution in the open oceans and proceedings of the GASAMP International Workshop on the impacts of mine tailings in the marine environment. So that's just some examples of the GASAMP reports and study series. Then we have the correspondence groups. These are established to review any particular situation uh, of concern uh, and to advise the executive committee, which is, is uh, substantially the 10 sponsoring organizations, if the uh, GASAMP members uh, feel that there should be a need for further action and then XCOM will make that decision. So here's some examples of ones that are being, uh, that are active at the moment. The relevance of inputs of disinfection byproducts into the marine environment. Causes and impacts of massive outbreaks of sargassum seaweed in the Caribbean and West Africa. Sand and gravel mining in the marine environment. So this is a growing environmental problem that we've been focusing on uh, and we're developing new insights into that. Of course, this has, um, substantial socio and economic issues associated with it. Updating the information on sources and levels of the main pollutants that are impacting the global marine environment. Uh, we refer to this as the 8020 conundrum. Um, some decades ago, uh, Gassamp actually made a very rough estimate that 80% uh, of pollution entering the marine environment comes off land and the other 20% is, um, is at sea, uh, sea based. That has unfortunately been quoted many, many, many times ever since. And we're now correcting that because we believe that it's, it's very different. And actually the land-based sources are much higher than that 80%. And the impact of armed conflicts on the marine environment and sustainable development. That's one of the more recent correspondent groups we set up. And of course, uh, the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. Uh, and that has actually been converted into a task force now. And I'll explain to you how these task teams work. They're established at the request of the sponsoring organizations, uh, and they're there to carry out specific tasks that do not require the establishment of a long-term working group. Or if a significant event related to marine environmental protection requires the prompt attention of GASAMP. With the support of the SOs, the sponsoring organizations, the chair of GASAMP may establish a task team to investigate such an issue and prepare a draft GASAMP statement back to the sponsoring organizations. Uh, one of the more recent examples would be the task team on open ocean pollution, which was set up to support a group of experts that prepared the UN regular process. That's the regular process on reporting assessment of the state of the marine environment. And another would be the task team for the review of exhaust gas cleaning systems for ships, which advises directly the Marine Environmental Protection Committee of IMO. More recently, GASAMP agreed to establish a task team, as I just mentioned, for the decade of ocean science. And this will act as an interface between the various GASAMP working groups and the decade coordination body, which is IOC of UNESCO. Looking at our functional timetable, what we actually do during the course of a year, um, sessionally, we have an annual session of GASAMP. We've just completed that two weeks ago, in fact, and that was a week long session online. Obviously, normally we would meet uh, face to face. That was not possible. Um, that's usually well. that is always hosted by one of the UN sponsoring organizations. And this year it was the in International Atomic Energy Association or agency, should I say. Um, members and executive committee meet separately first on the first day and then come together to discuss issues. The agenda items that we discuss at our annual session broadly include the annual reports from the chair and from the administrative secretary at IMO, the status of funding to GASAMP, the support arrangements from the sponsoring organizations and the actual membership of GASAMP, the planning of GASAMP activities um, going forward, contribution to other UN processes like the regular process for global reporting and assessment of the state of the marine environment, uh, sustainable development goals and accord the decade of ocean science. Identification of new and emerging issues and proposed actions. 
The members will discuss that on the first day and then bring those to the executive committee for their consideration. And scoping activities through the correspondence group and the task teams. And then we'll discuss the future work program, where we're going over the next uh, 12 months until the next annual session. There's also the intercessionals that we have. So it's not just meeting once a year. Um, the executive committee has intercessionals, usually once a year between the annual sessions. Uh, the annual sessions generally tend to fall around about August, September. So the XCOM have their intercessionals around about February. Uh, it's primarily to follow up on matters arising from the annual sessions. And then we have the members intercessionals um, as required. They are growing uh, because there's so many issues to discuss so far twice a year between the annual sessions. They follow up on matters arising from the annual session uh, and they discuss the uh, ongoing activities within the working groups and the correspondence groups. Again, they discuss any emerging issues that have come up since the last meeting and specific topics as selected by the members for discussion at those intercessionals. The working groups themselves that I ran through earlier have their meetings, of course, but those are as required and they call them as they need them. So, for example, when they have reached a point with a draft of a uh, project report, that would be when they would call a working group meeting. Also, of course, GASAMP attends um, and provides input to various scientific gatherings um, globally, particularly where they relate to the working groups. So, for example, um, uh, working group 38, which is on atmospheric inputs of chemicals, um, that will interact quite, quite frequently and quite commonly with the Scientific Committee on Ocean Research. And, and GASAMP representation to UN sponsoring organizations and other bodies. Um, in the good old days when we could actually travel, we, uh, GASAMP would actually visit the UN sponsoring organizations uh, and do uh, awareness raising and outreach. There was an external independent review of Kassamp's work, um, and that was undertaken back in 2005, so it's now 16 years old. It noted that Kassamp provides an approach to ocean sustainability by the UN agencies that is cross-sectoral and interdisciplinary. It's based on scientific understanding of marine ecosystems and human activities that affect them, and it avoids duplication within the agencies while identifying areas of common interest and bringing those areas of common interest together. Uh, under one discussion group. So the independent review further noted that GASAMP has been praised for its rigorous scientific assessments and reporting and is held in considerable esteem by the scientific community. I mentioned scoping activities earlier. You may wonder what those are. During its uh, various annual intercessional meetings, the GASAMP members will consider and discuss issues of growing concern and newly emerging issues, as I mentioned. <clears throat> These are then are brought to the attention of the, uh, the UN sponsoring organizations for them to propose further action as they deem necessary. If the sponsoring organizations feel that the concern needs action, they will request a scoping paper from the members. Uh, and some examples of recent arising concerns that have come up uh, actually several times in our, um, in, uh, in, in our main meeting, in fact, and in our intercessionals, uh, the effects of light and noise pollution from coastal development, obviously, but also from offshore renewables, shipping, and indeed now from deep sea mining. Um, these are considered to have a major impact on migratory species now. Uh, impacts from new energy sources, as we see um, the, the potential growth in bulk transport of hydrogen and NH3 ammonia um, products, plus their proposed use as a maritime fuel, the potential impacts that those could have um, if there was a spill is, is quite worrying and indeed um, in terms of the atmospheric inputs. And inputs from armed conflict on ocean and coasts. Uh, the correspondence group on that produced quite a substantial uh, draft report which is now resting with the sponsoring organisations for them to decide what they would like us to do with it. I would point out all of these issues have implications relating to socioeconomics and to marine law uh, and these issues are also addressed by GASAMP, and we have uh, experts on board as GASAMP members specifically relating to socioeconomics and marine law. So just to conclude then, um, more on GASAMP if you want it. Uh, we're more than pleased to discuss our work with any interested parties. Um, and we'd be happy to demonstrate how GASAMP might offer assistance and advice 
through the sponsoring organizations in relation to any areas of marine environmental protection. Um, so that's the uh, address, but it's very easy. You just try type uh, GISAMP in and you'll get straight to our main webpage. So uh, thank you for your interest and I'll hand back to you now, Andrew. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. And um, yes, thank you for that excellent introduction to Gazam. But you know, I'm fully aware that maybe some people on the on the webinar who are not that familiar with Gazam. So that's a really nice overview into how it functions and indeed the important role that it plays in providing independent scientific advice to the UN system. And also, you've highlighted there quite nicely the breadth of issues on marine pollution and marine protection that it's addressing. So thank you very much, David. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, over to uh, our main presentation. And I'd just like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kirsten Gilardi, who's the chair of GAZAMP Working Group 43. Uh, Kirsten is a wildlife veterinarian, co-director of the Karen C. Dreyer Wildlife Health Center and the Health Sciences Clinical Professor of Wildlife Health in the Department of Medicine Epidemiology at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. She directs the Californian Lost Fishing Gear Recovery Project, a program she launched in 2006. And in addition to her work in GAZAMP, Kirsten chairs the Build Evidence Working Group for the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, Triple GI and is also a member of the West Coast Marine Debris Alliance. So I'm sure you'll agree she's expertly placed and qualified to lead the working group. So I'd like to hand over to Kirsten, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and thank you for that nice introduction. Thank you to our sponsoring agencies, Frederick, John, Joanna, appreciate your opening comments and David, excellent overview of GISOMP. Um, I even learned uh, something from your presentation, having been a member for just uh, a little over a couple of years. So thanks, everyone. I'm going to share my screen and get this started here. Yeah. OK. Great. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night for some of you. Hopefully you can stay awake for this presentation. Um, it's my pleasure to do my very best to summarize a little over two years of work of um, a really exceptional working group. Um, we have prepared about a 160 page report that is going to be published shortly by GASAMP. Um, and so I'll, I'll do my very best today to summarize our, um, uh, our report. Um, at today's presentation, we'll, we'll frame the issue. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the working group, our principal findings, some of the solutions that we suggest, um, some of the knowledge gaps we've identified. And then as um, Frederick mentioned, we will have a Q&A session at the end. So I hope, hope you'll put your good questions in the Q&A box uh, for us um, to address. Um, okay, framing the issue. Of course, pictures speak a thousand words, um, and I think it's fair to say that um, probably now more than ever, there's a global concern and awareness and resolve uh, to do something about the amount of plastic that's entering the world ocean. Um, it, it, in terms of a definition, the working definition we certainly used um, throughout the, our, our work as a working group is that marine litter is any persistent manufactured or processed solid material that's discarded, disposed, or abandoned in the marine and coastal environment as a result of human activity. And when it comes to marine plastic litter, we can consider it both a contaminant and a pollutant in the global ocean. Of course, there are several uh, policy instruments for addressing the issue of marine pollution. I don't need to uh, tell this group, this audience about those uh, instruments, but suffice it to say that they form the foundation for, for our work and the work of the sponsoring agencies to address the problem of, of marine pollution. Um, before going into more on our report, I, I do want to again mention, as, as David mentioned, there has been a there is a working group, Gasan Working Group 40, that's been working on the issue of microplastics now for several years. Um, they've re produced several technical reports. I refer all of you to the Gasan website to 
uh, download those reports, which are a very extensive, thorough, comprehensive look at um, the issue of microplastics in the ocean. Um, I think one, as, as David mentioned, um, the GASOMP has a correspondence group that's looking specifically at this 80-20 um, conundrum, we call it, this, this um, sort of going uh, understanding or thought that when it comes to marine contaminants, 80% of marine contaminants come from land and 20% come from sea. But um, as David mentioned, um, that's based on um, some guest guesstimates and is an area of very um, hard work to, to revise those figures. And as David mentioned, it's likely uh, quite a bit more than 80% comes from land. Nevertheless, um, this is something that's uh, going forward is, is something that we all need to be working on. When it comes to plastic in the ocean, um, there have been some recently some global estimates of how much is entering the ocean, specifically uh, Jambeck et al. 2015 science paper estimating 4.8 to 12.7 tons of plastic entering the ocean annually. Um, um, what over 14 million tons of microplastics sitting on the seafloor, over 5 trillion pieces of plastic on the ocean surface, totaling 20, 250,000 tons. So these are, again, global estimates of the amount of plastic in the ocean. Again, our purpose as Gassamp Working Group 43 is to build a broader understanding of sea-based sources of marine litter, in particular from the fishing and shipping sectors to inform intervention strategies. And our sponsoring agencies are IMO, FAO, and UNEP. Our terms of reference uh, have been to identify sources of marine litter from sea-based sources from fishing and aquaculture and shipping, ocean dumping, and other uses to estimate the relative contribution and impacts of sea-based sources of marine litter, analyze how much plastic is produced and used by fishing and shipping industries, identify data gaps, identify hotspots for abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear, quantify the impacts of abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear, also known as ALDFG, and then re review and compare options for solution delivery. Uh, I just want to take this moment to um, acknowledge and truly thank this exceptional working group. Um, the members are listed here. As you can see, we come from all over the world, from a variety of areas of expertise, um, including um, marine pollution from shipping and um, from fishing and other operations in the sea. And as mentioned earlier, we had an opportunity to meet. Our first meeting was in person in October 2019 in Rome. Um, so you see a few members here. Um, we've got several members of our working group on the call today as panelists, um, specifically Francois Galgani, Sally Thomas, Rafaela Pirmarini, Pingo Hay, Emily Grilly, Kelsey Richardson, and Kyle Antonellis. So when I'm done with my presentation, they'll, they'll come on and, um, and join for the Q&A session. So uh, a huge thanks to this group, which did a tremendous amount of work in the last couple of years, despite the obvious constraints of the pandemic. Okay, we got underway in June 2019. Um, our first meeting, as mentioned, was in Rome in October 2019, and then we've been meeting virtually ever since. Um, just to, to give you a sense for our general approach to our terms of reference has been really to review the published scientific and gray literature on sources, causes, composition, and impact of marine litter from ocean-based sources. Um, so we really have focused on the uh, data that's available in, in the uh, pu published and also uh, gray literature. Um, we produced two interim reports uh, to serve as background documents for the IMO's uh, Marine Environmental Protection Committee meetings and FAO's COFI meetings, um, and then uh, submitted our final report to uh, GASOMP in May 2021. And as mentioned earlier, publication is imminent. Um, the process of putting together a technical report um, involved both peer review within the GASOMP um, members, and then also uh, review from several external experts in this field, and, and the report really is um, all the better for it. So I appreciate those um, excellent reviews and, and comments. Okay, so let's get into principal findings. We'll start with abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear, and just to um, get, provide you with a definition of what we mean by ALDFG. 
you know, abandoned gear being gear that's deliberately left at the sea due to either unforeseen circumstances or other reasons, gear that's lost accidentally and is no longer in the control um, of, of the fisher and can't be located and retrieved, and then discarded gear, which is released at sea without an attempt to further control or recover the gear. Um, the report provides, um, a, I, I believe, a really excellent global summary of fisheries and fishing vessels and fishers and the gear that they use. And um, we've included several figures and tables in the report to provide the context for our findings, um, including this um, graph of world capture fisheries and aquaculture production that appeared in FAO's 2020 report, showing that of course, these are both growth industries in the ocean and therefore the, 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 um, the need to study uh, impacts in the ocean because of this growth is, is clear. Um, we also review how the, um, what gear fish, fishing gear is made of, obviously largely composed of polymers for strength and durability. So the netting, the rope and the line, the floats and buoys that are used for um, fishing are largely uh, made of polymers. Um, we provide uh, tables to summarize those materials and also note that there are, are portions of fishing gear that are not made of polymers um, and primarily made of various um, metallics. In the report, we also looked at um, uh, the geographic extent of the, the problem of abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear. We have a couple of figures in the report. One. Um, noting where what countries have produced the scientific publications that we reviewed uh, in the course of, of our study. Um, also a figure from um, one of our working group members, Kelsey Richardson and her co-authors um, in a meta-analysis they performed um, and, uh, showing, and this was also a map showing where papers were published for that study. But suffice it to say that uh, one of our principal findings, of course, is that there really is no global geographic assessment of quantities or categories of abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear that allow us to identify hotspots. Um, very limited data on presence and absence, so it doesn't allow for us to extrapolate to a global measure from the papers that have been published. Um, fortunately, there are, there are ongoing efforts to capture more data globally. I just want to draw everyone's attention to the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, which has a data portal um, and is um, collecting data, um, collating data contributed by members of the Triple GI. And um, this map just shows where countries that are participating in that global data base with contributions of data from their countries on abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear. Um, so, fishing as a little, again, continuing with fishing. Um, I, I, it's clear that there's abundant evidence for causes of abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear. And so in our report, we, we do a pretty extensive job reviewing those and providing the references. Um, and these causes are environmental. They are the result of gear and vessel conflict. They are the result of fishery management and regulations, operator loss and error. And um, our, let me just go back to that. So. Um, just to, to be clear, again, a lot of the, the literature, scientific literature, really does do a wonderful job of showing why abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear ends up in the ocean. When it comes to quantity, um, this is, remains um, an area of active inquiry, let me say. Um, we often hear cited that there are uh, 640,000 tons of abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear going into the ocean every year. Um, in, in sort of doing a deep dive on this figure um, really um, came to the conclusion that this is really based on a study that was done way back in 1975 by the National Academy of Sciences, estimating that 6.4 million tons of litter entered the ocean annually from sea-based sources. And then later, um, McFadden's paper in 2009 estimated that 10% of global marine litter is abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear. So you do the math and come up with 640,000 tons, but we really, um, that's a number that is in desperate need of updating with um, further study. And, and, and this just goes to show that in fact, that, that National Academy of Science study back in 1975 actually estimated 1,350 tons per year going into the ocean. So the difference between those figures just um, obviously begs for 
uh, further uh, work on this um, on this estimation. And we are aware of some papers coming out um, imminently that will provide a, a new estimate of abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear goes into the ocean every year. We're eagerly awaiting that paper. Um, okay. The, the scientific evidence for the quantity of abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear, while we lack the global estimate still, we do have some, there are several good papers on that are specific to gear type and location. So for example, papers on blue crab and Dungeness crab pot losses in the US, um, papers on gill net and gear losses in Turkey and the UK and Europe, and then quantitative information is minimal in Africa, Asia, South America, and Antarctica. So um, again, much, much of what we understand about quantities of gear loss uh, come from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, in terms of fishing litter as a source, the scientific evidence for quantity is, um, again, we lack the global estimate, although we do have a paper, again, written by um, Kelsey Richardson, a member of our working group, and her colleagues that um, based on a meta analysis of publications estimated that 5.7% uh, of all fishing nets are lost, 8.6% of all traps are lost, and 29% of all lines are lost. And in our report, we include tables from Richardson et al um, for further detail. Um, okay, uh, impacts of abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear um, are many. Um, including economic losses, the cost of replacing lost gear, lost catch. Um, many, several studies uh, estimate the value of landings of targeted species that are caught in abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear. We, um, in particular, highlight a study that was conducted in the Chesapeake Bay on blue crab uh, pot, abandoned, lost, and discarded pots and the impact that's, that the, those pots have had on the fishery and the fishers. Other impacts include, of course, reduction of harvestable and non-target resources, including various listed species in some places, abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear is considered the number one extinction threat to some species. Um, marine wildlife morbidity mortality is well documented in the scientific literature. Um, habitat damage, for example, to coral reefs, also well documented in the scientific literature. Um, you know, an impact that we don't often think about, but should, uh, there are the social impacts. What are, you know, damage to aesthetics of the underwater environment, loss of ecosystem services, and of course, cost of cleanups, hazards to navigation and safety at sea, um, including loss of human life. Um, let's not forget the, the ferry that sank um, in 1993, and many lives were lost, tragically lost, and that, that sinking was due to entanglement of the ferry's propeller in uh, abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear. Okay, so switching to um, another ocean-based activity, aquaculture, as a source of marine litter. Um, for our purposes, we defined aquaculture as um, aquaculture in oceans and coastal bays and fjords and estuaries and lagoons, not inland. Again, and that included, included in a report, um, just a, an excellent table from FAO's 2020 report showing the growth in aquaculture production worldwide. Um, we have a paucity of published data um, on aquaculture as a source of marine litter, despite that growth in the industry. And um, thankfully for our, our <laughs> responsibilities of working group, we had a couple of really excellent uh, reports and papers that have been published recently on this topic. And I just want to um, acknowledge those as really excellent reviews of um, aquaculture as a source of marine litter. Um, of course, a lot of aquaculture equipment and gear is comprised of polymers for strength and durability, just like as it is for commercial fishing. So the netting, the mesh bags, ropes and lines, floats and buoys used for aquaculture are, are more details provided in table 3.1 of our report. Um, aquaculture as a cause of litter is uh, the, 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 the reasons are are, are many. Um, obviously, nor just normal use, wear and tear causes loss, accidents, which, um, for example, interactions with vessels and aquaculture gear, extreme weather events, uh, improper waste management, um, and then farm decommissioning farms um, often just left abandoned um, rather than removed. Um, there is no geographic 
assessment of the types of aquaculture marine related marine litter, but um, it's fair to say that expanded polystyrene styrofoam is the most documented type of aquaculture related litter um, in some parts of the world. It's um, considered to be the majority source of plastic particles on beaches, um, for example, in South Korea. Um, and a very significant component of the floating debris in mussel farming areas in southern Chile. Um, again, also, there are very few, there is no global geographic assessment of the quantities of aquaculture related marine litter. Again, data are regionally specific and um, our estimations truly, but um, are significant. So in the European economic area, potentially 95,000 to 655,000 tons of aquaculture related debris are present in the ocean with 3,000 to 41,000 tons added annually. In Norway, an estimation of 25,000 tons annually. In the North Baltic and Mediterranean seas, significant percentages of debris on the seafloor and floating are believed to come from aquaculture. And we have estimations from Korea and Taiwan as well. Moving on to shipping as a litter source, just keeping an eye on the time. Um, Again, the report provides a global summary of maritime trade, geographic hubs, vessel numbers, carrying capacity, the cruise industry, and then acknowledges the challenges to the assessment of shipping as a source of marine litter, um, not the least of which are the fact that ships travel vast distances. Um, oceanography influences what happens with waste that comes from ships that are moving across large distances. Um, shipping related litter is not necessarily exclusive to shipping, so um, tracking as a marine litter as a source from shipping can be difficult. Um, it, is, it is definitely true that remote sites are disproportionately impacted by shipping related um, litter and um, conspicuous items like pallets or items that are exclusive to shipping, shipping like um, heavy large rope and oil drums. Also are off, can be su suggestive of shipping as a source of marine litter. Um, the report identifies different types of shipping related litter. So uh, operational waste from, um, from shipping, polymers in ballast and gray waters, uh, plastics in hull coatings, lost containers, and lost vessels among um, major uh, shipping related sources of marine litter. Um, the report also, um, I've found, I feel like I sound like a broken rec record. No, there are no global studies of shipping related plastic litter. Studies, again, are geographically specific. Um, and the report um, describes those papers, um, for example, um, plastic bottles on Tristan de Cunha in the South Atlantic. Um, likely coming from transiting ships. Um, in the character, character of, of litter washing up on beaches and on the seafloor in certain areas, suggesting shipping as the source. Um, and uh, in pa papers showing that plastics were the largest portion of pollution incidents in the Western and Central Pacific um, from 2003 to 2015. So again, just the report reviews all of these papers, but um, again, our, our task was to take a global look at this issue and um, there, again, is currently no global study of this. Um, passenger ships are thought to disproportionately contribute to the problem of marine litter coming from shipping, while passenger ships are a small percentage of the global shipping industry, but they're estimated to contribute uh, a disproportionate share of all waste from shipping. And of course, we know that passenger shipping is a growth industry. Uh, recreational boating is a contributor in terms, and some studies have shown that beach litter, um, it's, it's a significant portion of beach litter can be attributed to recreational boat, boating at specific sites. And dive surveys in some areas, including the Mediterranean, show that a significant percentage of single-use plastics can be attributed to boating. The report also goes through um, the available scientific evidence for gray water and paints and coatings of ships as sources of um, plastics to the ocean, uh, specifically table 4.1 reviews these, so th those as sources. Um, we've co we cover lost containers as a source of plastic for the ocean. Um, just a note that there really isn't a central database to track lost containers. 
um, damage and loss reports are rarely shared by the industry and um, estimated annual losses of containers vary dramatically. We all know that there have been some very high profile losses of containers resulting in um, plastic litter at the time of publication. Uh, we, we covered these particular uh, incidents. And of course, we know the more recent um, container loss in Sri Lanka and the, um, just the washing ashore in Sri Lanka of um, billions and billions of plastic pellets. So when these incidents occur, they are definite point sources of plastic um, to the ocean. Abandoned vessels as a source of, of plastic in the ocean um, is uh, also dis is discussed both in the, our chapter on shipping, but also in our chapter on ocean dumping. Um, fiberglass um, embedded polymer resin or fiber reinforced plastic boat production started in the 1950s and the life expect expectancy for most FRP vessels is 30 to 50 years. And so um, as boats come to the end of their useful life, there are very few end of life options. And any, anybody who's been to a marina anywhere <laughs> can see that the problem of abandoned uh, boats is, um, is real. Um, ship decommissioning is a source of plastic. 70% um, of commercial ships are dismantled in South Asia, and this generates marine litter, including plastics, which have been shown to accumulate in the sediments around these um, decommissioning shipbreaking sites. Um, there are no global studies of the quantities of plastic litter entering the ocean from the shipping sector, but in our report, we do our very best to summarize the existing scientific literature. Again, these are specific to areas. Um, and uh, we have summarized those in table 4.3 of the report. Uh, there are also no global studies of, um, of uh, or we've also summarized um, papers that do estimate the quantities that are coming um, from certain um, shipping sectors and that um, information is estimated in table 4.4, again, just um, the available evidence for ship waste that's generated and delivered annually. And more importantly, what is the waste gap? So waste gap being potentially the amount that is ending up in the ocean rather than um, appropriately discharged at port. Uh, we um, do review microplastics in marine co coatings. Um, this is information that is also addressed by Working Group 40, but it was appropriate to include in this report just the percentage of marine coatings that use microplastics um, and um, how much of marine coatings, um, how much marine coatings account for the release of microplastics to the ocean. So the report uh, reviews the existing literature on this. Um, shipping as um, a litter source the impacts of shipping related litter. Um, there's no published data on marine organism entanglement in shipping litter specifically. That's not to say that we don't know that it occurs because there's um, certainly anybody who works in marine wildlife rehabilitation space um, has dealt with plenty of animals with, um, you know, uh, cargo straps and things um, and, and causing entanglement injuries, but those have not been published as review. Um, but really, the, some of the largest impacts are economic, and um, we cover those um, potential impacts in our report. Um, just the, the litter coming from shipping um, costs quite a bit for cleanup, uh, causes damage to vessels, um, the cost to remove litter from harbors and marinas and the need to dredge um, are all cause uh, economic, um, have an economic impact on the industry. In our report, we also cover ocean dumping as a litter source. Um, as per the London Protocol, uh, allowable wastes for dumping include dredged material, sewage sludge, vessels and platforms, and organic material of natural origin. Um, None of the London Convention, London Protocol countries have set specific action levels for litter or microplastics in any waste stream, the only exception being the Republic of Korea, uh, which has um, stated no dredge material disposed of sea cannot contain synthetic rope, um, used fishing gear, et cetera. Um, very few studies quantifying the plastic contest the content of wastes eligible for ocean dumping, um, but it is important to note that microplastics are four to five orders of magnitude more abundant in sediments than in suspension, uh, especially in coastal areas. 
And uh, this chapter also notes that, um, and this is potentially an emerging issue, but scuttle spacecraft, um, the impact of scuttled spacecraft as a source of plastic in the ocean is basically unknown. Although we have to note that hundreds of spacecraft spacecraft are purposely have been purposely crashed in, in the ocean since the early 1970s. And we also know that launches are often over the ocean. Um, we also explore other sources of, um, of marine litter, including offshore oil and gas exploration and extraction. The use of microplastics in oil and gas exploration and extraction is significant. Uh, plastics are present in drilling fuel, fuel fluids, industrial abrasives, cement additives, propents, um, and there have been some estimations of the quantity of plastic input from oil and gas exploration reviewed in the report, including um, 159 tons in the UK, 102 tons in the North Sea. So um, we, the report does review what we do know about oil and gas exploration as a source of marine plastics. Uh, the report also reviews other sources of, of plastic marine litter that are sea-based, including the use of shark and stinger protection nets at beaches, weather monitoring equipment, weather balloons that are lost and um, allowed and, and purposely um, discarded at sea when they reach the end of life, artificial reefs, um, scientific research equipment and activities that are left behind after research is finished, fireworks and munitions. Okay, um, chapter, I believe it's chapter seven, um, presents um, the what we could glean from the scientific literature and the gray literature on solutions for abandoned all sources of, of sea-based litter, starting with abandoned, lost and discarded fishing gear, uh, but again, um, refer to the Global Ghost Gear Initiative and their reports. Um, they've spent and have dedicated to working with groups around the world to address abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear and do a really great job of, of summarizing different uh, mitigation um, uh, options, including those that prevent the loss and abandonment and discard of fishing gear, those that mitigate, and those that cure the problem of abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear. And those are summarized in our report. Um, there really is a substantial body of literature to inform action on um, prevention, mitigation, and cure measures for abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear, including changes in fishery management and regulatory measures, improved facilities for end-of-life gear, modifications and improvements in gear design, education and awareness raising, and abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear removal. Uh, that we also include um, tables again from Global Ghost Gear Initiative reports on best practices and codes of conduct as mitigation measures for um, ALDFG. Um, the, in this chapter, the focus for mitigating um, shipping as a source of marine litter, litter really focuses on the need to standardize waste management protocols at ports and to improve port reception facilities as um, an important mitigation measure for the problem of shipping as a source of marine litter. And then chapter eight, I believe, uh, we, um, we go through and identify knowledge gaps. So we start with some knowledge gaps that are um, sort of globally relevant and, and really span um, all sea-based sources of marine litter. If it's not abundantly obvious from um, this presentation and summary of the report, we of course have um, global geographic data gaps and really need a better understanding of the type and quantity and impact of sea-based sources of marine litter in most areas of the world. Uh, we need greater spatial coverage and we need long-term monitoring and technology development to, to be able to gather that data. Um, Ideally, these efforts would, um, would utilize common methodologies to be able to collect the data across all sectors and geographic areas to facilitate quantitative comparative assessments across time and space. Again, we're, we're talking generally about sea-based sources of marine litter. Um, they, you know, in order to address the 80-20 conundrum, we really need to be able to distinguish sea-based from land-based sources, um, and that that being able to do that will really 
greatly help to inform waste management strategies. Um, we need to establish a, a risk of impact of sea-based sources of marine litter with the consideration to whom and to which compartment and where and when. Um, all of this data will help inform mitigation strategies for areas of highest risk. And we need a much better understanding of pathways and transport really is a paucity of data on pathways and transport and a, and a reliance on, on models um, as a result. Um, there are very few, there are a few uh, local, um, regional and global estimates for direct and indirect costs related to sea-based litter on ocean users and industries and coastal communities. Those studies, more studies would, are extremely important because of course they help provide the impetus for change. Um, and then um, we need more studies on health impacts of marine litter. Um, we know that it can cause direct injury to, to marine organisms. The, the, the extent to which it contributes to toxicity impacts on marine life is, is critical. Uh, again, um, Working Group 40 is addressing um, the health impacts of microplastics as a part of their terms of reference. Okay, specifically with regard to abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear, the working group identified the following knowledge gaps. Um, the portion of global marine litter that is ALDFG uh, needs still needs to be um, done. We would we need to do a, more work on differentiating um, among sub gear types as contributors to abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear. Um, there's a real need to distinguish between actively deployed gear and ALDFG as, as cause of wildlife entanglement. There's often an um, a, a assumption that entanglement is occurring in ALDFG, but it's probably also occurring in actively deployed gear. Population scale impacts of ALDFG on target and non-target species are needed. Um, we need to fill the geographic gaps, a look at contributions of ALDFG from the recreational fisheries uh, we need a lot more information on uh, fish aggregating devices or fads as a source of marine litter and um, aquaculture operations as sources of marine litter. With regard to shipping, um, knowledge gaps include um, mapping and modeling of shipping related litter sources and distribution and pathways to better evaluate when and how and why litter is disposed of at sea. Um, the use of microplastics in ship surface coatings and the socioeconomic impacts of litter from shipping. With regard to ocean dumping as a source of marine litter, um, again, uh, geographic gaps in availability of data, uh, the characterization of plastics in the material that's dumped at sea, Dredged materials as sources of marine litter and then other sources of marine litter. And then in the chapter where we look at, for example, oil and gas exploration um, and scuttled spacecraft and, and weather monitoring equipment, et cetera, um, uh, we, we do need a better understanding of the contributions of plastics from offshore oil and gas facilities, a better estimate of sh shark and stinger net loss, weather balloon loss. Um, global estimates of fireworks as sources of litter, um, probably not, not considered enough, the amount of plastic that's going into the ocean from uh, fireworks displays, and then a uh, the global call to the to marine underwater scientists um, to do a better job of estimating and mitigating the quantity of abandoned scientific equipment. So with that, um, that was a very fast run through, again, a very long report that um, I want to, again, thank uh, my fellow Working Group 43 members for the incredible amount of work they, they did to put the report together to our sponsoring agencies, IMO and FAO and UNEP. Thank you for your, um, your request of our work and your support. Um, Gisant members who um, were just fantastic about reviewing drafts of the report as we went along, the technical secretariat for all the support provided in the, this process, and again, external reviewers of the report whose uh, comments and suggestions really um, greatly in, improved uh, the report. So with that, I will open it up to questions for, 
for me and um, my fellow working group members. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten, and thanks for an excellent presentation on the work of the group and the main conclusions and findings. And I must admit, um, it was certainly a challenging terms of reference that you had to review the work in the scientific and grey literature on all the issues you were considering there. So uh, it's uh, I really want to commend you and the group on all the work that you've done in a relatively short time frame as well. Um, yes, so um, we will open the the floor up to questions. I noticed I had a, a, a couple already that were placed in the chat, but if you've, uh, participants can use the Q&A function and we can bring on, uh, if some of the other members of the working group want to turn their cameras on, um, if any of the questions are directed that they may be able to answer, you can, you can ask them too. But uh, the first one was quite a general one, actually.